Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. And this will be the last video in the look at A Touch of Evil, the Supernatural game from Flying Frog Productions. So we are here and I am just about ready to enter into the final showdown with the ghost ship. All of our characters have moved to the icy waters to instigate this fight against the ghost ship. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that have transpired before this. Then look at how our characters have progressed. And then I will uh, take a pause away from the video, do the showdown, and then come back with a final wrap up. But using the ghost ship as the villain, um, it created for a lot of really interesting things, especially with his like kind of like main minion, the ghost captain, how he was coming out onto the board more than a couple of times. You know, one of my characters would go, we would find a layer card. We would discover where some of the cursed gold was being hidden. We would find the gold. And then on that next mystery phase, you know, the part of the game where the villain takes its turn, that ghost captain would just so happen to show up either at that exact location or in an adjacent location. So it really felt like this uh, ghost captain was also hunting the same treasure I was. And I know that's all chance. I mean, all of that has to do with the dice you roll, the uh, cards you pick from the layer deck. But like Secrets of the Lost Tomb, this game, like I have said before many times, the theme is so tightly woven into everything that the game just kind of like automatically creates these uh, serendipitous moments where all of these random elements come together to form some kind of cohesive narrative. And a lot of that I'm sure is me as a player, you know, in my imagination, connecting the dots and finding patterns and finding connections where maybe they really don't exist. But the game allows me to do that effortlessly. Uh, one uh, set of cards or one type of card that the expansions add really throw a lot of monkey wrenches into the game. And I had a really difficult time with these. And those are the orders influence. And I love the way these things work and I love the thematic uh, things that these cards add. Because in this game, in uh, same as in Fortune and Glory, same as in um, Shadows of Brimstone, there is this Order of the Crimson Hand. I, I'm trying to think, is, is this the one like thematic element that ties all of those three games together? Shadows of Brimstone, Fortune and Glory, and A Touch of Evil. There might be more, but I think this is like one of like the main elements. Uh, this Order of the Crimson Hand is kind of like the main bad guy that's always working in the background of all of these games. Um, it would be really cool if Flying Frog Production did a game where you got to play as the Order of the Crimson Hand somehow. That would be that would be really cool. But so these cards, the orders influence, they are mystery cards. And, you know, you draw at least one mystery card on each villain phase on each turn or each. Uh, the, the first hero will draw one during their villain phase. And these cards get attached to the various um, elders that are either at Shadowbrook or in uh, Tidewater. And um, they make it so you can't utilize their uh, spaces very well. They make it more difficult. Um, the one I had, or I had four actually out at one time, just really crazy that they all came out. Um, so the Order's influence was attached to Dr. Manning. And every time I went to the doctor's office, I had to pass a five plus cunning check or take D6 hits. So, you know, the doctor's office is one of the best places to heal, but it was deadly to go there because the doctor was under the um, influence of the order. Now, the doctor ended up not being evil, and I like that. That's a really cool thing because, you know, he might have been being blackmailed by the, uh, the, the Crimson Hand. 
And so, you know, he was lashing out at the heroes, but it wasn't of his own free will. He wasn't being evil. He was just trying to, like us, you know, survive as an individual, possibly. So I ended up revealing his secret and he wasn't evil. So then I was able to take him as part of my hunting party. And he is going to be part of my hunting party because he um, basically acts as a defense against wounds. And then we also had, um, so the Order's influence was on Mayor Carver, who I believe the mayor um, ended up dying. Yeah, the mayor ended up dying and the mayor was not evil. So he did not come back from the dead or fake his death to uh, work for the villain. But while he was under the order of the, in, uh, the, the in order's influence, um, all of the items in the town of Shadowbrook cost two investigation each or plus two. That is really difficult. That made buying items far more difficult than it needed to be. However, that also meant that I could just kind of ignore that part of the game. And so that was like one thing I didn't really need to worry about. Um, and then we had this one attached to uh, Lady Hambrook. While she was alive, a hero ending their movement on a corner space must roll a d6. On a roll of one or two, they are um, attacked. It's not really a corner space. It's I believe you're supposed to play it's any like named location that has a location deck. So like the abandoned keep, the old woods, forgotten island, lighthouse. Maybe it's only supposed to be for the four corner spaces on the main board, but I don't think so. I think it was any location, because that's the in the spirit of the card was any named location with a location deck. So maybe I was making the game a little bit more difficult for myself, I'm not sure. But you would have to fight these guys, you know, the minions. But fighting minions in this game is actually, um, it's actually beneficial because it's one of the best ways to get lots of investigation. And then finally we had uh, the Order's influence was on Lord Hanbrook. And while he was alive, I would roll a d6 at the start of each mystery phase. And on a roll of four plus, I would have to draw an additional mystery card. So that also made the game way more difficult. Uh, these, <laughs> these, the Order's influence cards are a real pain in the ass. And I hope the next game I play, I hope they don't come out as frequently <laughs> as they did this time. And um, yeah, so I ended up the game with um, a few events to take into the final showdown. So we ended up with recovery that play at any time. The hero can uh, heal D6 wounds, except during a fight. So you can do it in between fight rounds. You can heal D6 wounds from a hero or D3 wounds from the villain if you were playing the competitive version. Um, just a scratch. Play this card when every when any hero, town elder, evil elder, or the villain is about to take a wound to prevent that wound. And then avenge the falling. Play during a fight round to gain plus two fight dice for each uh, dead town elder, not evil elder, and each hero that is currently KO'd. So right now I have two dead town elders. I have um, Mayor Carver and Lord... Hambrook are both dead, but they were not evil. So that is going to be um, a pretty good card to be used in this showdown. Take cover. Uh, play during a fight round to prevent all hits a hero would take on a d6 roll of three plus each. So basically this gives you a three plus armor on um, any hits. If played during a showdown, all heroes and town elders involved may use this ability for one fight round. That is awesome. Probably use that just right at the beginning. And then aggressive combat. Play to give any hero, minion, or villain plus two combat for one fight round. And autopsy. This isn't going to do any good um, in the showdown, but this was the one that I could have used at the doctor's office. If there was a town elder dead, I could have gained D6 investigation. I just never got around to using that one. Uh, the two town elders that I am taking into my final showdown, as mentioned, uh, Dr. Manning, which gives me basically gives uh, me armor. And then I am going to take the Widow Jessica. At the start of every fight round, heal any wounds you have on a D6 roll of 3+, plus, so she helps me heal. And she's going to give uh, plus 2 fight dice. So you have to assign each one of these to a certain hero to use during the showdown in the cooperative mode. 
And I also have one militia token because if you remember, we had sent that militia out there to the icy waters to await our arrival to attack the ghost ship. So I need to figure out who, which one of the heroes is going to get that character or these uh, bonuses. Let's take a look at our heroes real quick, how they ended up. All right, so Argot Black, uh, Blackwell, he ended up with, um, he's got four influence. He ended up finding three of the cursed gold. He got a plus one cunning chit. I also was able to level him up using these new cards. So he is at level two now, which is nice. That extra wound is really going to help. He's going into the fight with one wound. And then he ended up with a number of cards. I'm just going to grab the cards here and we'll take a look at them. So he ended up with a treasure map, which gave him plus one honor and plus one cunning. And he no longer had to test him, test to pick up investigation from the board. He got that from the shipwreck. I've got the magistrate's mandate. Play this card on any hero. That hero may now carry one additional card from the old woods or the abandoned keep. I did not end up using that, unfortunately. Um, I also had this hat here the rider's hat, which would give me a, I could roll 2d6 for my movement and pick the one I wanted, very handy. And we ended up finding this book of death, basically the Necronomicon, which would give me plus one combat. And anytime I am KO'd, I may pay two investigation instead of having to lose the normal d6 items. The way to uh, mitigate that roll a little bit. And then I also found this coachman, which worked really well with the rider's hat. I could move an extra two spaces as long as I was not entering the fields or the marsh. So again, really, uh, really helpful there. He was able to move around the board really easily. And then Maria here, she ended up with a ton of um, investigation. 13 she has. She only found one gold. She upgraded her combat and her spirit. She got a number of items. I did not upgrade her. I probably should have, but I don't think it really would have mattered much. Her upgrade card, it's really not very good. She gets plus one cunning, and then she could spend three investigation to add plus two to her fight dice. Well, I would have to spend 10 to upgrade her and get rid of a card. I guess I could have gotten rid of this doctor's card on her last turn. And then she would have three investigation left where she could use her power once. I don't think I'm gonna retcon that, but I just I found her upgrade card to be kind of lackluster. So she's just gonna probably end the game alive or dead with a lot of investigation. Probably poor use of her investigation throughout the game, but she ended up with a um, Sailor's Pistol, which gave her plus one spirit and plus one combat. She got that from the lighthouse. She ended up with the Cutlass, which would give her a plus one combat. And you could reroll on um, I mean, making a spirit, cunning, or honor test. She got that from the inn. She ended up with the ship's manifest, which gave her a plus two spirit. And when her spirit was six or higher, which it was for a few turns, you would automatically gain two investigation at the start of each turn. That was very handy. That's how she ended up with so much. She got that at Smuggler's Cove. I got the Charmed Relic. Anytime I draw a card from a location deck, I could uh, choose to discard and draw again. She, that was a town item. She spent a lot for that. We got the Moonstone uh, Talisman, which gives her a plus wound. That was from the Forgotten Island. And then this um, Endurance was an event that would also give her a plus one wound. And then finally, for our heroes here, we had um, Henrik Cartwright. He also ended up with a 12 investigation. We were able to upgrade him, which gives him plus one spirit, plus one combat. And when KO'd, he no longer loses anything. Very handy. He did not end up with very many cards. He ended up with a plus one spirit and a plus one cunning. And he just had really bad luck drawing cards. So he ended up with from the lighthouse, a plus one cunning. He ended up from the windmill, a plus one cunning. And then he got this pirate's hook. And that would give him a plus one wound. Plus he can reroll one of your fight dice. So that's gonna come in handy during the showdown. So I think what we're gonna do is, I think we're going to assign, I wanna give the armor probably to 
the hero with the fewest wounds available. And I think right now that is Argot. He has one, two, three, four, five, six. Maria has one, two, four, five, six. And um, Henrik has five. So we're gonna give the armor, basically, because any time that I would take a wound, I can roll a d6 on a four up. I can prevent a wound. We're gonna uh, have Dr. Manning fight with Henrik. The Widow Jessica allows you to heal. I'm gonna give that to Argot because he already has one wound to heal. And then I am going to assign the Militia, which is gonna give plus one combat and an additional wound to Maria. So that is the assignments there for the fight. And I think we're about ready to go in and fight the, uh, the ghost ship here. So the game track ended up almost at the end here, pretty close there. Um, we also, let's see, the ghost ship has a ton of wounds. I think it's 30. So you take uh, the number of wounds, which is 12, and you multiply that by the number of heroes. So that's 36. And then you add any bonuses. So 36, 38, 40, 41, 42 wounds it's going to have. Holy crap. <laughs> that's a lot. And then it's going to do plus two um, fight dice. And it uses the fight dice of the ghost captain under the where is my gold. So the ghost cap captain gains plus two fight dice against any hero with less than three cursed gold. So that is actually going to be only against Maria will he get that bonus. So that's going to be that's going to be very good. And the chart, the uh, darkness chart is not in a red. If it was in a red, then he would get an additional bonus. So now comes the point of the game where you just roll piles of dice and let's see what happens. I will be back. Bye-bye. Well, the showdown is over and our heroes lost. We did get the ghost ship down to only 10 wounds left. So it wasn't entirely uh, one-sided, <laughs> let's say. Now, I know I could have escaped at any time during this fight and kind of like regrouped and and played some more and, and, and perhaps gone back and challenged the ghost ship again. But in uh, I just decided to do a, a, a final showdown. The track was getting a little closer and I wanted to do a final showdown just so I can kind of like move on and get a new game onto the table because I am greatly looking forward to what I'm going to be playing next and what we're going to be taking a look at next. So in this game of A Touch of Evil, featuring Argot Blackwood, Heinrich Cartwright, and Maria de la Rosa, the heroes have lost their battle against the evil ghost ship and the ghost captain. Shadowbrook, Echo Lake, and the coast have fallen to evil. And that is the way this game ends. Um, like Arkham Horror, I am not a huge fan of, of the showdown in this game. Although you can escape, usually what I find in A Touch of Evil, by the time you approach the villain, you're kind of signaling to yourself and to the other players that uh, maybe it's time for the game to come to an end. And once you get to that point, it is really just a bunch of just huge handfuls of rolling dice and looking for fives or sixes. And I would have gotten one, two, three, four hits there. I never once got that roll. So congrats there, uh, dice. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for betraying me. But um, but yeah, usually at that point, I'm kind of like, okay, you know, I've played the game for two, three and a half hours or so. I'm just kind of ready for the game to come to an end. Let's see what happens. Um, and yeah, just I, I wish there was another way. This is probably my only complaint about A Touch of Evil. I wish there was another way for the game to end besides a showdown. I wish there was an investigative um, victory condition or some kind of a narrative victory condition. Like maybe the ghost ship, I don't know, 
maybe you could also find the bones of the haunted crew and if you could bury enough of them then the ghost ship would leave the coast and uh and not torment the land anymore something like that which maybe you could just have a, another victory condition to where it wouldn't just end with huge handfuls of d6 being rolled looking for fives and sixes that is really my only complaint about this game is its ending um you know 98 percent of this game working up to that point is absolutely fantastic i don't think i would change a single thing i love this game so much i love the stories it creates i i love the 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 look the atmosphere i really do like the photography the manipulated photography art in the game i think it adds a very unique quality to the game it really makes it stand out um i like the production quality i love the tokens you know the cards are that i i'm not a huge fan of the thick glossy cards i know some people are they tend to get stuck together a lot but um they feel neat that everything about this game it just feels different than a lot of games i like the town elder system and how you never know you have to investigate them to see if they're good or evil and the kind of bonuses they can add i love how the different mystery cards work in tandem with the the villain and the the town elders uh, I like the, how the event cards, especially in a co-op game, you keep them in a single uh, hand so any of the, your heroes can use them on any of their turns. All of the location decks are interesting. It is kind of a pressure luck element. You want to go to a location, draw a card. Hope you, hopefully you don't get an enemy. Uh, you can hang around in the location for longer to get another card, but you might have a lingering penalty where you're going to have to roll a d6 and on a roll of a 1 you have to face a minion however i also had this card out which made lingering uh more deadly so on a one or a two i would face a minion so i didn't want to linger as much in this game i like how each of the villains adds a little wrinkle into the gameplay the ghost ship was very fun how i had to go out and hunt for this uh, lost gold and this cursed gold so all in all i absolutely love this game it really probably should be on my top 10. I need to play Fortune and Glory again to see which one I really do like better um, without, you know, I don't want them to be a tie because I feel like that's that's a cheap cheap way out, but man, it's, <laughs> it's really tough. I have so much fun with A Touch of Evil and um, it just really captures my imagination in a way that a lot of games don't. So, all right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of a long look at A Touch of Evil and my thoughts on the game. You know, this is a game that I, I will definitely play at least once a year. And every time I do, it is an absolute blast. And I almost always lose because I always get to this point where I just want to do a final showdown. And it just, it, it, I almost always lose, but I just, I enjoy that like 98% working up to the showdown so much that it keeps me coming back for more. So, all right, guys. Well, uh, we will talk to you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye.